Rez is no, joining no, yeah. in a bit as well. By the way, best best first slide ever. Yeah, I really. Like yeah, this. yeah. I found this GIF, so I uh, <laughs> just made sure to embed it in the context, especially of last week's presentation. You guys can see this, yeah. Yeah. Good full screen. Um, I see it, yeah. Yeah, so I guess we I called it sheaves forcing and other consequences consequences of an inaccessibly infinite world. Um, kind of trying to make a, a call out to last week with talking about cardinals, ordinals, and all of that stuff. Um, and um, I think we'll see pretty quick how they're related to each other. Okay. So um, it's kind of divided, I guess, into five parts. I don't know if we'll actually get through all of this today um, because some of it's quite dense. Right, but I, I only have an hour and a half. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we can, we can maybe cut it into two or something, especially since we had uh, WhatsApp issues before. Um, we wanna start with kind of um, going through the connections of topology and phenomenology in the context of what led you and I guess we remind ourselves why we're interested in topology at all, right? Um, then we'll go through, after that, we'll go through hopefully a visual and more intuitive definition of sheaves. I know we've covered them before, um, but we'll go through that for a while. Um, then we have the logic of sheaves of structures, like how do you sort of build models on top of sheaves or as sheaves as models of like certain period. And then we'll get to the model theoretic forcing stuff, which is very, very dense. So we can kind of gloss over most of it, but hopefully get the conceptual pieces out. And then some connections with some bed use stuff at the end. Um, yeah. Oh, wait a second. Let's go. Here, okay. So I want to start with this is a couple quotes from Aristotle's Physics, which was um, in that Rene Tom um, article I sent you. So this is just, I guess, to, to motivate about questions of topology, which we remember has to do with ideas of boundary, interior, and parts and whole, right? Um, so let me just read from Aristotle. We ought to try to make our investigations such that, uh, such as will render an account of place and will not only solve the difficulties connected with it, but will also show how, that the attributes supposed to belong to it do really belong to it. And further, it will make clear the cause and the trouble and the di difficulties about it. When what surrounds then is not separate from the thing, but is in continuity with it, right? That's already very topological there. The thing is said to be in what it, what surrounds it, not in the sense of in place, but as a part of a whole. And when the thing is separate or in contact, it is immediately in the inner surface of the surrounding body. But the surface is neither part of it, of what is in it, nor yet greater than its extension, but equal to it. For the extremities of things which touch are coincident. Um, so I think here, right, we already have that, um, there's some notion of object, which is more topological in the sense that it's like fuzzy and um, there is, it's, uh, especially this, this last part about how the thing that's in it and the surface are neither uh, completely a part of it, but also neither completely separate from it, um, but are um, equal to it itself and all parts of it at the same time. Um, so, right, Aristotle is already thinking about this stuff, um, but then topology itself kind of generalizes all of this, right? It says, I have some sets. I'm going to choose some, this notion of something called an open set. Uh, I'll say when I first saw what like an open set is, it wasn't very intuitive besides like thinking of it like in the real numbers as like whatever a ball or something that you can kind of always approach the boundary forever in, in, in some intuitive way in an open set. Um, but I think more specifically, right, it's the importance of this, this choice of open sets is that it gives it a structure of um, 
nearness without measure, right? So there's not an explicit measure on the space in order for it to have a topology. We can have um, like whatever the space of, we can talk about the space of commodities. Each object um, within the space of commodities, we don't think of as like an individual point, but as some fuzzy set, right? Let's say it's like a car. There are many ways that you could perturb or change um, the production cycle and like how you actually make a car such that it's still a car, right? So it's a continuous notion. Um, so um, it seems that this notion of open set is sort of more analogous to what we think about an object when we say something like, I don't know, a commodity or anything like that than like an individual set like point thing, right? So I say, um, the topology is a structure of nearness without measure, which coincides well with how phenomena appear as amorphous blobs that we sometimes can and sometimes cannot put a measure to. The boundaries, interiors, and parts are something we can coher coherently talk about. Um, so when, right, if the world was finite, which I think some people might, might disagree with us saying it's infinite and would say it's finite, you could slice, you could literally list out all the ways that you could slice the world. Um, and then you can just have a list of every single part that is within the topology and just accept everything and that would kind of be the end of it. But if we contend that the world is infinite, um, it becomes very difficult because of the questions of like the continuum hypothesis, right? Even the notion of if you have uh, an infinite set, uh, even just the natural numbers, it can be the smallest infinity. Um, the size of its power set is not stable in like all models necessarily. Um, so there's always, whenever you're in these, if we're gonna take sort of as a base, um, I guess like axiom of faith that the world is infinite and that all objects are inherently infinite in that they could continuously change in a whole bunch of ways and still be that same object. Um, then the space of just about any world is also infinite and thus the size of its, uh, what Bedou and being, event, being an event calls the state of the situation, right? Is always gonna be inaccessible. This is something he agrees with us as well. Um, so then the ch what that means is that the choice of topology in an infinite world is very important, right? There can be anything from uh, the simplest where the open sets are just the real numbers and nothing, in which case you're not differentiating anything. Or you could do the extreme where every single set is open and then suddenly the topology isn't saying anything about the structure of the world, but just taking the world sort of as a pure, like undifferentiated set with no internal structure. Um, yeah, I don't know if Dennis, you have anything to add if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, no, I, that's, that's a perfect introduction to uh -huh. it. And I was thinking, um, what you're saying, the, the, the concept of boundary is also really important um, mm -hmm. because we can think of open sets as just uh, regular sets where, where you remove the boundary points. And then they, because the, one, of the, one of the possible definitions of an open set is that its complement is closed. Mm -hmm. so, so it's like uh, you have just the interior without the boundary. Um, of something, um, and then you can um, you can ask the question of like, okay, but then what are these boundary points that are being removed, right? Like, why why in a given um, in a given production process, like you mentioned, or or some kind of thing that you're trying to topologize, like what are the what are the boundaries that you're trying to like forget in some sense mm -hmm. um because yeah i don't think like when we say infinite usually we, we have in mind like something really big but it can also just be something really small but with the mm -hmm. boundary boundaries uh excluded yeah so that i think also gets us into um kind of this example with the ship of theseus i just wanted to mention 
Um, but first on the left, we see here, um, just to remember in set theory and standardly, right? The logic is classical in the sense that belonging, right? The basic operation is belonging either some for some set X, either it's in some set, some other given set, or it's not in the set. There's no in between. There's no like fuzziness here. Um, but from the topological perspective, right? Where your base notion is um, an open set um, and seeing whether one open set is a subset of another one is not uh, just yes or no proposition, right? Mm -hmm. You could have it be completely a subset. Okay, then completely, yes, yeah, sure. Or you can have it be completely not a subset or you can have some intersection, which is non-trivial. Um, so these objects in general um, seem, and especially when we think of parts of objects, it's usually important to keep in mind their intersection and whatnot and not think of things only as individual things composed within sets, right? So um, in this context, um, we can kind of, I think, reimagine the classic what from uh, uh, the ship of Theseus question, which is after, basically how after how many replacements of the ship uh, of parts of it, is it like the same one as before? Um, so in, I guess, like the topologist response is that outside of some context here, context meaning some topology of the space, um, the question is really kind of incoherent, right? So like in the context of, for example, a museum maybe that like found Theseus's ship after he died sometime and is trying to preserve it and explain the context of whatever his life, blah, 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 blah. The individual parts of it might matter quite a lot. Whereas for like the actual uh, sailor, whatever Theseus himself, it would not, he would probably replace things as long as it worked for him, right? The ship doesn't have the same sort of, I guess like mm -hmm. almost sentimental value that maybe in the context of a museum or something else it might have. So these different contexts give different topologies of the space that um, give us different differences that make a difference, right? So a topology mm -hmm. in a way is, is a way to keep track of differences that make a difference in the sense that um, it tracks nearness, right? And the if two things are both in the same open set, um, then they are in some senses, right? They can be said to be near each other. Um, so this is gonna come back a lot. Um, and yeah, um, the really important notion here is that the parts, the structure of which parts of the situation count, um, both will determine the logic of the entire situation, right? The topology itself determines the logic and is also dependent on the context, right? So it's dependent on whatever the given context or topology of the space that we're starting with. Um, yeah, should we keep going? Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Topology, everyone buys it. Um, so after last week, I think there was a little, I know Reza's not here, but I heard there's a little bit of like a, uh, maybe some confusion over, I think, Bedu's notion of the apologist and the inhabitant. Yeah. Um, and I think that this sort of topological point of view gives us some some insight right so the ontologist sort of we you know sees a situation from the outside um it's almost like it feels i don't know if this is exactly analogous but it feels like the role of something like a historian right looking at at, at the fact at whatever the event after the fact kind of like once already everything's known and they sort of by definition cannot be within strictly within the situation um, so, I mean, mathematically speaking, this is like looking at some surface, like a torus, for example, from the outside, which from the out, like, or from some outside embedded space, right? Uh, so this would be looking at like a surface, like a torus as like a donut, rather than looking at it from the inside where, right, the sides are through, I have an image of this later, 
uh, my face like should have given a quick. Here, it's this image. On the left here, the one that says stretched underneath is kind of like the, the uh, topologist from seeing this space, oh, sorry, the ontologist, seeing the space from the outside and not from within, mm -hmm. right? So from the outside, there's actually some distortions of the space. It sort of looks like it's curved. Um, and in a sense, it, it is in one direction, even though the space, the entire space itself is flat, meaning that it's really just a folding of this flat Euclidean space here. But then the inhabitant is sort of like on this right side or in the middle picture. They live within the space and they might not necessarily see these boundaries and know that they're connected up until, until they like do some experiment that can figure out this global connection that they can go around and get back to the same place. Um, the ontologist obviously can see that right away, but it's always conditioned as being within some other context. Um, so the inhabitant, right, otherwise is, on the other hand is like, is within the situation and um, always only sees what is like locally accessible, AKA what is within some open set around where they reside. Um, and I think this is be a really good perspective for the rest of this talk mm -hmm. to keep in mind because the sheaves perspective is sort of like an inhabitant perspective. It's how for each one of these sets, how do we construct a structure that respects certain conditions? Um, any yeah, questions? This about makes perfect things? sense to me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I always like this idea of, uh, it's like the, the ontologist is like the Ill Euler description of you know, mm -hmm. like an invariant. And the inhabitant is more like Jordan theorems kind of thing, like paths you can take on some, yeah, like from local to local, but it tells you something about the global from inside, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, okay, I'm just gonna keep going. So um, I just wanted to mention this one last thing that um, we wanna really make sure to keep in mind that the to think of the topological spaces here is lattices, right? So we think as uh, some lattice of sets that have the inclusion relations and that each element of the lattice, rather than thinking of it as like some point or rather some random post site, it's gonna be actually an open set. Um, one reason for this perspective is usually when we think about lattices, we think about uh, finite ones, at least intuitively, but they can be super infinite, right? Like they can have ordinals within them, like in each, mm -hmm. even in, in each line, like th there's nothing that's preventing things like that. In fact, there's, I believe, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, John Conway's construction of the, uh, uh, what's it called, the hyperreal? Surreal numbers. Or the surreal numbers, yeah, is basically doing this. Um, it's like, a bunch of ordinals on post sets and you can construct things much, much further than the real numbers, um, both infinitesimals and big infinities. Um, so uh, uh, when we think about the topology, right, as a space of lattice of parts, right, another thing to keep in mind is that it's looking at it as a hating algebra, which we remember is a, a model for um, the structural rules of intuitions and uh, intuitionistic logic so it doesn't need to um, satisfy the um, uh, law of the excluded middle mm -hmm. um, but we always wanted to think of it as like an embedding within the greater power set right the power set is this big um, inaccessible we always want to think about it as this inaccessible thing because it's it's always too too large to sort of enumerate constructively. Um, so by thinking of the hating algebra as almost um, like a more tractable, uh, almost like approximation of it, mm -hmm. um, this this is uh, it's just a good perspective to have when we when we start talking about sheaves and things. Um, and then by right when once we start constructing the sheaves. Um, they're basically constructed in a natural way, AKA um, respecting the inherent structure of 
uh, a topological space. Um, and it's because of this that the geometry actually ends up informing the logic. Um, and this is like essentially straight out of the atomic logic of Badu, but in a more general sense. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully a little bit more intuitive. Um, and enforcing uh, the conditions, this is kind of on the bottom right, this is a little bit of a quick summary of what the technical aspects of, at least from this paper are, that uh, forcing a set of conditions on some classical structure, right? So if you wanna force something on ZFC, for example, adding more sets to the power set of the natural numbers so that we get uh, the continuum hypothesis to not be true in some model. Um, so we take first the classical model, then we expand the classical structure into an intuitionistic one. Um, and this usually involves, this is oh, something we'll mention briefly, the uh, double negation topology by basically replacing everything with the double negation. Um, and because the rules of double negation, when you apply them to any uh, Boolean algebra end up becoming a hating algebra, then you get this intuitionistic structure. And at the end, you sort of glue everything back um, along a generic filter. And then this gives you this force um, classical model from, from the previous one. Uh, and that's, it's, that's not the, on, like the only universal way to do it, but it's sort of um, the general structure of how we use it. Um, yeah, uh, my view on this uh, yeah. is that, the, the lattice structure is is why we can there's a because both topological spaces and logical proposition share a lattice structure we're able to kind of um jump between the two to mm -hmm. to do this to perform this kind of um it's like a shift of perspective but which which operates around this lattice uh, so on the one hand you you can choose a topology as a series of inclusions, right? Um, as, a, as this partially ordered set of inclusions of parts of the space, um, but also with propositions, you can connect them via how one proposition, what uh, one proposition allows you to say about other propositions, right? Or mm -hmm. allows you what not to say as well, right? Because if you affirm one proposition, it excludes a bunch of other ones because it would be, those other ones would be contradictory Mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. the one with the one that you uh, affirm so both share this lattice structure and so this whole forcing over sheaves and everything is it's all about trying to think both of these lattices together and in this infinite way where there's it's not clear how um the global structure of things is laid out um and so like you're very much taking this position of the inhabitant um, mm -hmm. because you can't really trust that you know the entire structure of this topology, um, but you can uh, cleverly, if you know certain rules and tricks, you can cleverly design a way to, to um, talk about this, uh, uh, this, <coughs> extra, this extra thing you're adding. Mm -hmm. One thing just I want to ask you guys before we move on to more complicated stuff is that, I mean, we, we mentioned last time and it's something we, it, it's like just a, a cool to realize that with set theory, you get a sort of division of a concept that usually we thought as being one. Like there's something about numbers that suddenly become split into ordinals and cardinals. And those two things have different information and moving between the two allows you to say things you couldn't say directly by just keeping with the order, for example. So, mm -hmm. but there is, that split is kind of the split between order and measure. Cardinals with measure, order with ordinals, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, they are, for natural numbers and so on, they have a certain type of uh, total ordering and so on. But it's interesting that in the way that the move from like, Topology, the way topology splits open sets from measure and associates open sets to lattices on the one hand, right? Mm -hmm. So there's an ordering of open sets, but that's not the same as a measure. It seems like a analogous split of a constant. Like 
I can talk about which which is I mean when when I try to dazzle somebody with philosophy of mathematics 101 I talk about this oh is isn't it amazing that set theory splits uh, these two aspects that we usually think of them as the same and that has something to do with the infinite in the infinite this, this split becomes very clear it seems like the the similar sort of counterintuitive intuition that is at the bottom of everything is a similar thing that open sets require you to do. Suddenly you are allowed to talk about order going in a kind of bifurcation with regards to measure, right? And mm -hmm. then you can move between the two and get information, new information out of it, right? It's no longer, and again, infinity plays a part in seeing how the two things really get split and not, mm -hmm. it's just not a way of speaking, right? Because yeah, it is. It's really profound. It is yeah, it's definitely something like an order on a choice of of subsets, mm -hmm. um, which gives you what it gives you. And this is an important thing: is it's like the structure of the world from the perspective of an inhabitant, mm -hmm. right? So if the uh, uh, topology was uh, simply trivial um then nothing would be differentiated right it, like mm -hmm. everything would be one and if you have on the other hand where everything is open then everything gets individually atomized right and it's just the individual like each individual point is open and then therefore everything's open right and then so then you you in in both extremes right you have essentially no information mm -hmm. so it's important that it's one connection, right? That I think is is important is that because it's intuitionistic, it has a really deep connection with like constructed logic. Mm -hmm. So the perspective of the inhabitant is always one that is like I'm gonna is is constructive from right from the place that they are. It's gonna construct something on top of it rather than just like prove the existence in some like globally um that something does or doesn't exist so um mm -hmm. yeah i think that's that's a really good perspective on why topological spaces are kind of important and it's a it's an, an intuitive notion and it's one that takes a while to get used to especially when you think about like like it's place without measure like how do you especially once you have like something like the real numbers right that's already enumerated like how the hell does can this thing be like have a structure of uh, uh, which sets or how the sets like are glued together without having an explicit measure on it is like kind of an unintuitive thing, but mm -hmm. it works because yeah. because these sets are infinite and because of the rules of how they glue together. Um, yeah. Okay, let's go on to uh sheaves this is kind of the fun visual part so hopefully we can just spend maybe the rest of the time on this possibly we'll see um so the idea of sheaves right is kind of motivated by um originally was fiber bundles which is the picture kind of on the left over here so a fiber bundle is basically when you take some base space and you put something on top of it right so at each point you put whatever a bunch of things right here there's four points each point has uh what six points above it okay a very boring fiber bundle but it's something right you can you have the reason why and we should go through all these terms because we're going to use them and they're kind of confusing at first but so this the stock right we think of it literally like a stock of grain is the thing that is above the space right and the to motivate fiber spaces and they're very important um, in a lot of physics and other things is for example like a tangent space right so if you have some surface imagine like a circle at each point you have the tangent space at the point which is a vector space that's attached to the point which is where things like um, uh, like the velocity arrow lives right so whenever you say that um, an object is here moving at the speed what you're saying is um, I have this point here and then this element of the tangent space um, 
and the tangent space has certain properties how it moves around and that determines like the um, differential structure of the space. So a sheaf is sort of a generalization of this idea of a fiber bundle where you have above every point, right? You have some object, but here, instead of your base space just being um, some whatever arbitrary set, um, and instead of each one of the fibers being often the same thing, at least simple fiber bundles, usually you just put the same thing over, for example, tangent space, usually like that. Um, but a sheaf kind of topologizes it in the sense that um, above each point, right, you have a set of things, but the set of things has to respect the topological structure of the space. So we see here we have A, B, A is this big left set, and B has this big right set, right? Um, a or B, which is uh, the combination of them should have just the middle one. And then the A and B is oh, going to be the whole thing. Um, that, like this flipping here, is the contravariance of it. But we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but the notion of the, the, the basic idea is it attaching structure in a way that sort of um, respects the topology of the space. And I have this mm -hmm. image here still. Um, so they formalize, right? So this is kind of conceptual. They formalize the idea of a collection of things that can vary depending on where you are, right? And where you are here is not going to be a specific point. It's not going to be, I'm just here in space, but where you are is somewhere within the topological space. So you're in, in some open set. Um, so the, right, as I said, the data that you attach respects the structure of the topology. So the topology is sort of what's given. It is um, the world for the inhabitant. Um, so a set itself, and we'll mention this also later, can be thought of as a sheaf over a single point. Um, so you can, any set, right, you can imagine here, you can just put any unstructured set, put as many things as you want on top of it. In the sense that generalizes all of set theory, just take, you take one thing and then you can take multiples and repeats of that thing. Um, but that's sort of like the degenerate case. It's not very interesting, but um, generally, right? A sheaf is much more interesting because you have not just these structures, right, that are above each individual point, but the way that they interact above the points will usually be pretty non-trivial. So it, the sheaf carries a structure which varies over a base topological space. Um, the structure acro varies across the base space such that it respects the topology. In other words, it's a sort of continuous functor. This is one, I think, the simplest way that I like to think about it is, um, or maybe a continuous pre-sheaf, if you want to call it, but um, it's sort of generalizes the notion of continuity, not just for right, a function, but for a function in general on any um, category. Uh, an intuitive example of this is something like sets in time that you can just continuously vary over, but there um, we'll get into hopefully more examples. Um, make a little bit of sense? Yeah. Okay, let's continue. Yeah. Okay, so this is the actual um, topological definition on the left here. So uh, all a topological, uh, a sheaf over a topological space will be is just gonna be uh, a couple X. And one thing I wanna know is that um, when you see the definition of sheaves, there's gonna be two different ways you see it. Um, one is this sort of topological way in which the arrow from the sheaf is kind of going in opposite. So here we see the arrow goes, uh, oh, okay, here the arrow goes down. So this arrow, this is the sort of topological arrow definition. So this is like the definition of a sheet as something like a cover, right? So we have this complicated space up here and I project it down to the simpler space. So each one of these gets projected to the simpler space. Mm -hmm. Okay. A, uh, uh, a 
fiber will be just the complete inverse where I take the point and I just get the set of all the things above it. So the fiber basically gives you this like stock thing. Um, then a section, right, is gonna be uh, something that locally is like this fiber. So what that ends up being is something that is like literally like a cross section that cuts across this. You guys see my mouse moving around? It yeah. cuts across this way. Yeah. Um, so, right, so the, remember the terms we're gonna have, stock is this, fiber is the actual function that gives you the stock. Um, a section is a choice going this way, and the sections are gonna be our general notion of an object. A sheaf will be like a structure, and a section will be like an object on that structure. Um, and these germs are these individual places in which and there's a reason why they're called germ um, that comes from algebraic geometry, where these stalks um, are glued together at a point. Um, but I just went back to uh, point that out, but that this arrow here, right? So in the first definition of a sheaf, it's just going to be a couple, it's basically a cover. It's going to be some base space X. And then this function, this functor E, uh, oh, sorry, this other space E and the functor P, uh, where E is also a topological space. And this functor E is a local homeomorphism, which means that for each one of these, so this is up here will be E, uh, and on the bottom is the P. So for each one of these points up here, actually, let me go up here. For each one of these points up here, um, wait, sorry, one second. Uh, this thing being a local homeomorphism, yeah. It means for each point in E, there's gonna be some open set around it such that this map here uh, down and then back is um, a homeomorphism, which means that it looks topologically the same. Um, so what that means is that the sheaf is basically locally um, modeling your space at every point, but in a bunch of different ways. Um, so yeah, similar, similar to yeah. the, the chart and manifold thing, right? Like um, mm -hmm. if you look closely at a manifold, it, local Let's parts of it, of it local, local slices of it are flat, like a Euclidean space. But then if mm -hmm. you zoom out, if you zoom out, the whole thing can be mm -hmm. some crazy, crazy thing you can't even imagine, right? So this, that's what this uh, condition number two says. Condition number two just says, if you restrict your function to V, mm -hmm. a, lo a, local, a local subset, then you get this flat structure again. You get this, uh, you, not necessarily Euclidean, but just this, uh, like you were saying, homeomorphic mm -hmm. structure, which makes it, you know, a familiar some kind of familiar structure, but mm -hmm. it doesn't doesn't require that the whole has that structure. That's the interesting thing. It's like you you have two objects locally; they look the exact same. But if you were to zoom out, one of them looks totally different. Can look totally different than the other. Yeah. Um. One good way of thinking about this is that. Um, at each uh, point, right, in the, in the sheaf, so in the structure that is on top of the base space, at each point there, locally, it looks the same as the base space, locally. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So it basically, in whatever it maps to, it ends up being homeomorphic to it, so it's it's a local it's a local mapping of the base space, but adding additional structure. Um, I think a really the good um, I think we mentioned this later. The good um, example to keep in mind uh, this is from the Benavides paper is um, thinking of causal structures as uh, a sheaf over spatiotemporal states. Okay, so that is, recall here, so on, it would be like on the bottom, 
this is like the, for example, like the manifold of the universe. It's all sets of uh, whatever locations and times that are valid, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then above it, we have uh, basically this, the, the causal structure where um, you have different things aff affecting one another. And then for each right, point in the causal structure, you have like a light cone, both forward and backward of all the things that could possibly have caused that point and all things that could possibly cause it in the future. Um, so then you can think of, uh, right? Like the causal structure of the universe as a sheaf on top of whatever, the manifold of the universe itself. Just means like the, the space of the universe. Got a lot um, when people go to, to like the explanation of causality in general to explain, the, like to, to explain the mathematical yeah. concept, which is more complicated than that. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, so um, a simple example is. The yeah, a simple example would be the, the causality. The universe is a very simple example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a good motivating example. No, I, I um, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, so this definition on the right, well, notice, so the, the, the left one, right, is this like topological definition, which all, all it's saying is that a sheaf is something that uh, is a, basically a local homeomorphism, right? That each point in, in this sheaf space, it locally looks like some local area of the base space. Um, this other one kind of goes in the opposite direction, right? So rather than the base space being X, as on the left, here the base space is uh, is this O here. Right? This is like a uh, the lattice of open sets, where now it's a pre-sheaf that's going to take uh, for each open set. This is it's going to have above it a bunch of things that are attached. Um, so the set is exactly what that. So it's for each open set, you have a set of uh, usually functions or something that are glued together in a certain way. Um, and um, in order for uh, it to be a this, this pre-sheaf, which remember basically just has to restrict to sub-objects. And uh, yeah, that's the main condition. Um, it will be a sheaf if it's uh, for all here, for all open covers. Uh, the set f of u is an equalizer of the pair of functions. So this basically is just going to say that uh, you can restrict from either one of these places, and it should be the same. Um, so I think the one on the right is kind of a less intuitive uh, definition than the one on the left, um, at least once you kind of understand what's going on in the topological space and whatnot. Um, yeah, Dennis, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, and I agree. It's definitely less uh, intuitive. I think the, the interesting thing, maybe just we don't need to try to understand it completely, but maybe just um, thinking about how the gluing condition of a sheaf is captured by this equalizer um, mm -hmm. limit thing. Because right, um, we, we want to be able to add an additional um, condition on pre sheaves that if you if you find two pre two two open uh, sets that overlap then you should be able to glue along those open sets to produce uh, a bigger chunk of the pre oh no yeah the, the, Gabriel's message Gabriel's message um, yeah. um I understand you just got Two kittens, yeah, they're sleeping behind me. Um, wait for him to come back. Yeah, our dog recently puked and then ate the puke. Oh no. Yeah, and we were too <gasps> slow. We were too slow to stop her. Oh no. Yeah, sorry for that gross image, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but anyway, for the this this uh, limit, I'm yeah, I'm really interested in understanding that um, this limit definition because it implies like 
um, there, there can be many pre sheaves that mm -hmm. kind of, uh, there can be many pre sheaves that do similar things in terms of they, mm -hmm. they, they obey like the restriction condition, um, but they don't assemble quite correctly, right? Into a, yeah. a sheaf. Like they don't glue uniquely. And I'm, I'm kind of interested in that idea. Yeah, there's a great example um, from, I don't know if we should wait for the but I can just go. There's a great example from complex analysis of this um, where the sheaf of, uh, sorry, the pre sheaf of bounded. Uh, holomorphic functions, right? Mm -hmm. Holomorphic just meaning basically differentiable for complex. Um, this is good enough to know. Um, but the pre-sheaf that takes just bounded complex functions, right? So it takes, for each open set, it just gives you all the bounded and uh, uh, holomorphic functions on it. It's not a sheaf because of this theorem that um, any bounded function on, on the entire complex plane is constant, um, which is kind of crazy, which is saying that any bounded function that's continuous or that, that is differentiable, um, or sorry, any function on the entire complex plane that's differentiable will be, um, will basically go to infinity somewhere. But because, because of that, um, a very classic example of bounded the, the the sheaf of bounded functions is not or pre sheaf of bounded functions is not a sheaf. Oh, it's interesting. Yeah, I, I need to look that up. Yeah, there's a um, lot of it's it's because of Louis Bilster. It's a it gets very deep into complex analysis things, but um, I think on the Wikipedia page there's a whole section sorry, um, yes. of like pre sheaves or not sheaves. Um, you're back. Dealt dealt with yes. the dog. Dealt with a dog's vomit, yes, in my car. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's look at this. Um, I just added these as, uh, oh, Reza just, I saw. Um, oh, I guess Reza had a couple more things on his left. We can get back to that. I can do it in, uh, next week, no problem. Yeah, yeah we can do that. Um, but I just added these, these two images here. This is the same definition um, as, as examples of sheaves from geometry, which are covering spaces. Um, so here, right, the, the sheaf will be the structure on top of the surface, right? So the base space in this case is actually the surface itself. Uh, and the structure on top of it is this covering space. So in both of these situations, these are what's called the universal covering space, which means that you can basically make any type of, in this lower case, um, two-hold torus um, out of this sort of weird tessellation. So this is actually, even though it doesn't look like a tessellation, this is a tessellation. Oh, this is a tessellation of, is that just my thing? Okay, this is a tessellation of um, hyperbolic space. Um, so these are all hyperbolic octagons. Um, octagons, yeah, that are all um, the same. Ah, there, my slides are freaking out. There you go. So each one of these is actually the same. Um, and the sheaf here, right, is going to take each point in the surface space to all of the points that corresponds to here. So for example, in the torus up here, the sheaf takes this guy who, these are both the same, right? This is mm -hmm. just when you glue the red and the blue, it's this space. Uh, so the sheaf is gonna take this guy to all of the places that he corresponds to in the unfolding of the covering, right? So this is the covering space, meaning that if you go the other way, it's this is how you form the quotient. Um, and here, the same thing. Uh, you have right above each point, you have a point inside each one of these domains. Uh, 
uh, you have a point inside of each one of these domains. Um, and the functions on it um, also respect this, right? So it's gonna be, sorry, it's gonna be a local homeomorphism, which means that for any point in this space here, I can choose an open set that's small enough, right? As long as it doesn't like cross over and go behind or something. Uh, I can always find one that's small enough such that it'll fit here and be homeomorphic. Um, so these are kind of like some easy starting examples to um, start having things visualized. So here we see the same thing. Um, yeah, does this make sense? Mm -hmm a little bit to visualize the structure on top of some basics. Um, so another another way, oh, I didn't really completely finish this. That's okay. Um, another way that we can think about she's a sheaves over graphs, right? So here, this is an example of a sheave over a graph, which for each node, um, you attach some vector space. Here, these are all different vector spaces. And for each uh, vertex, you also attach a vector space such that um, uh, the maps uh, you have, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. The edges are, la, 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 la. Oh yeah, they're, they're all vector spaces and, um, for both the vertices and the edges with, along with maps between the vector spaces to here. So then the section on the sheaf ends up being a choice of a bunch of vectors here, such that they respect all of the, all of these maps that we have. So I plug in the vector here and I get it, uh, I put it through this map and then I end up getting the same vector that I chose for here. So they should all sort of respect the structure. So here we can see it's like, it's a graph and it has a structure on top of it where each node is a vector space, but the vector spaces are mutually um, compatible based on their gluing. Um, uh, and I like this, this um, quote, this is from Benavides, that in, in agricultural terminology, right? A sheaf is a collection of stalks of grain bound together by twine. In mathematical terminology, a sheaf is a collection of stalks of data Right, so each one of these things, these like vector spaces here is a stock of data um, bound together by linear maps. Where here, um, linear maps really means linear maps in the context of, mm -hmm. of this particular example. Um, but in general, right, if you have some other structure, it doesn't have to be linear maps. It can be whatever, whatever maps respect that structure and are natural to that structure. Um, yeah. Okay, here, this is, this is kind of the uh, example about uh, causal, causal states and, and uh, spatial temporal states from the Benavides text I thought was quite good. Um, which this image, right, shows, oh, it shows kind of the intuition that on the bottom we have sort of the, the space of the universe. And above each point, a spatio-temporal state, which is a location and a time, we could have many observers intersect at this one point. And the observers here um, are gonna be thought of as the sections, um, which are either, depending on how we take the sections over the space space, right? If the observers vary over, uh, time, so that's like within the light cone, um, then that's gonna be a time-like observer. And if they vary um, uh, like crossing between light cones, going faster than light or going in some uh, perspective, right? In the rever reverse of time, um, and then that's a, a, a light-like, or sorry, sorry, uh, space-like observer. Um, so I think it's, a, a cool example because it shows how you can have, right, this structure and bottom, which is space, which um, is the base structure for gluing together all of the 
um, local uh, instantiations of causal structures, right? So local causal structures are, I have a, whatever, the limit of it is my light cone behind me and in front of me. I have things that possibly caused me and things that I possibly caused, right? But my light cone and your light cone and everyone else's all intersect in such a way. And when we sort of intersect them all together, um, that is gonna be the structure on top. Um, and uh, it's something that's both, it can allow us to think of it as on top of, built on top of space, but also as um, sort of uh, uh, slicing it by its, the constraints of the space itself, right? The constraints being uh, whatever, special relativity, quantum mechanics, all whatnot. Um, yeah, it's like it's useful in general yeah. relativity because it's uh, you basically think of like if you think of all possible observers in the universe, like if you choose any two of those observers, they're not going to agree on what's actually happening causally mm -hmm. uh, because of, because of the complexity of this manifold and um, their relative velocities and so on. Um, but if you if you find a, a local enough fragment. Um, between two ob observers, they can agree, right? Mm -hmm. So, so these observers, they because they lie above the same neighborhood of X, they all agree on what's happening. Um, so, you we can we can take that topological structure and actually we can infer the topological structure from the points mm -hmm. of agreement as well. So, if two two observers agree, we can say they are in the same neighborhood. Right. So yeah. actually, it can go both ways, right? If we if we know the topology, we can say these two observers must agree because they're local to each other. But if we know that two observers agree, we can also say that they are local, and that actually gets weird, right? With with the entanglement, and mm -hmm. all that weird quantum stuff, because you can say like, well, they're not. Sometimes two things are not local to each other, but they do agree on some some information. So, I mean, I don't know anything about that, but it's it's another example of how like topology can inform the the propositions we're able to make and and propositions can also inform the topology uh, of the space. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I think this quote just to um, go through this again, just to remind ourselves, is good to go through. So this is a sheaf F on X can be described as a rule, which assigns right at each point of the space, a set FX consisting of the, what they call germs, which are the individual uh, uh, data that you're post, uh, pasting um, to be considered as defined in neighborhoods of the point X. So this is the really important thing is that everything is defined in neighborhoods of X, as Dennis was saying. This is the extensional property of truth for sheaves. Um, and the sets F sub X for all X, right, can be pasted together by a suitable topology so as to form a space or bundle projected onto X. Okay, so this is like the pasting together of all the causal spaces. Um, an individual good function, right, for the sheaf is then a cross section of the projection of the bundle. So this is taking, right, for each element in the base space, we're gonna choose something from the sheaf and we do it in such a way that respects the topology. So then viewed in this way, a sheaf F is a set F of X, which varies with the point X over the space big X. Um, so this is the perspective of uh, sheaves as what are called structured variable sets. So they are uh, structured in the sense that they always have a structure which is preserved which is in this case, the topology, uh, but they're variables. So we can describe them how they vary continuously, but being sort of the same object, right? So you can look at like the sheaf as it moves through different, through different points in time. And we can, it helps us, it's ways to keep track of um, different kinds of objects in the space. Um, and um, the really nice thing about them is that it's, Whenever you get 
right? Whenever you have a sheaf, you never just have one sheaf, right? Because you also have any, you, you're automatically given by the topology just by taking uh, uh, subsets, you can always get a sub, sub sheaf of the original one. Um, and not just by cutting through the original topology, but you can cut through like the sheaf itself. You can just take individual pieces or whatever. Um, so it's adding quite a lot of structure that it's not like it's a sheaf is never only concerned. It's not just like one instantiation of something because of this topological structure that's very uh, fuzzy. You end up getting anytime you have one, you have basically a whole family of them already. And you can do things by building up these families over time. Uh, okay, any questions? Um, Sheaves definitions. I know. I don't know how much sense it made. No, I think I think it's making a lot of sense. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, now we get yeah, yeah. that has been not clear so far. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so here, let's. I guess we want to talk about a little bit of the motivation of the logic of sheaves of structures. So now we're, so we have this idea of sheaves, which is kind of like a continuous functor. Um, but now the motivating idea is that we wanna localize truth values on propositions such that we can infer new propositions from old ones, depending on the topology of the space. So we wanna take this structural topological idea of sheaves and we wanna see how we can inject basically logic to it. Um, and we'll see that the space itself can be topologized by the valuation of propositions, which will um, work out, will uh, spell out explicitly. And so recall from um, uh, in one of my previous talks, I think we talked about this stuff a little bit, but um, just in model theory, just what a structure is. Right? A structure mm -hmm. is basically, um, for mathematics, it's kind of like the language plus an interpretation. So it's this, it's the syntax plus the semantics, but it's not um, like, it doesn't, if you just have the syntax and the semantics on its own, there are many, it's, it's not, that doesn't give you a completely unique model in and of itself. And we'll see that. Um, but it's basically just a choice of, some base set and uh, a set M with interpretations for symbols, which are uh, relations, which a relation you can think of as just uh, a subset of the cross product. Uh, it's not the cross product, just the product of um, how like an N area relation would be a product of N many of your spaces. It should be some subset of that. Uh, uh, function symbols on it, so which functions are allowed, and constant symbols, which are going to be like your variables and whatnot. Um, and the underlying set M is the what you call the universal domain of the structure or the universe of the structure. Okay, so this is this is kind of the background. Just basically, we can have this abstract notion where we have. Um, uh, a first order language that has uh, symbols, quantifiers, all that stuff. And then we can add relations, functions, constant symbols. Um, so we're going we're gonna to take this kind of to the next level <coughs> by doing sheaves of structures. Um, so a sheaf of structures over topological space, X, is going to be right a sheaf that uh, has uh, over each point, it has all a bunch of these things such that they agree with one another, right? And the basic notion of um, when we talk about the structure, we're going to say that the sheaf forces a proposition, right, at some point X, if for um, the sections, right, these sections are going to be the objects of the sheaf. Um, if we can say that uh, there exists a neighborhood of U such that that uh, 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 such that the 
uh, preposition applies for all points in the neighborhood. So this is the extensional um, notion of truth, that truth will not be just is something true at a point, but is something true in a neighborhood in which you live. And this gives us the idea of local truth, that, for example, something can be true, right, if you, uh, if it is sort of close to you, for example, in your causal past or future, um, or if it's like close enough to where you are. Um, uh, yeah, so then we can continue going, uh, 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 instead of just defining right forcing at a point by allowing, um, by saying that it's going to be when uh, the proposition is true in a neighborhood of that point, we can uh, say that it's forced on the entire open set, which is kind of what we're going to, uh, the direction we're going to go with this. Um, if for every single point in it, there's an, it's extensionally true in this way. Okay, so this is just basic, um, basic definitions without too mm -hmm. much detail. Um, yeah, we're forgetting the points. The, basically, we want to we want to get rid of the points and just talk about like forcing over yeah open sets. Yes. Um, so. Um, Forcing, so this kind of brings us, I guess, to, to Kripke models, which um, are end up being uh, a specific situation, a specific subset of models, cheese of structures in general. Um, but this is, this is, we're just going through kind of the basic definition, right? So a Kripke model is going to be, it's going to be over a post set. So this is the basic notion that we're still going to be keeping. Um, for each point in the post set, um, the stock over it, which is KP, is going to be a classic T structure. And then this is the important thing is that for any two uh, uh, elements of the post set, if uh, they're comparable, right? So if one is less than or equal to the other, then there is a, uh, a homomorphism, right, between these structures. So you can say there's one going from the lower one to the upper one. So it's sort of like embedded within the other one, um, such that um, it's gonna be the identity for itself um, and such that it's also transitive. So the Kripke forcing is when you have this thing of a Kripke model and then um, you inductively define um, how propositions, which are going to be reinterpreted, not just as um, right symbols and things, but the propositions themselves will be admitted subsets in the situation, right? So the subsets that we see, in a sense, are going to be the subsets such that we can say something about them, right? That we can actually pick out subsets. Um, and you see there's all these uh, uh, technical uh, uh, ways of doing it. Um, you see that, for example, like the relation is going to be forced if and only if, right, you get uh, at some node and everything is, is always forced at a node P. So it's forced here. When you think of these node P's, we think of them as open mm -hmm. sets. We're forcing at open sets, right, if and only if this uh, 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 point exists inside, it's kind of the obvious thing, exists inside, these are the relations that are over uh, P at this point. Um, and the same thing applies um, for others. In particular, another one to note is that the uh, uh, negation is going to be if and only if for all, right? So we're going to say that P forces not some proposition, if and only if, for all q greater than p, so everything above our base point has to not force that preposition, right? So it not only does it have to be true at p, but it has to be true at everything above it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that picture depicts, yeah. and yeah, I mean, th three, four, and six. 
for for number three, four, and six, they all have this uh, property that it has to imply something about the the future nodes or the 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 nodes and the that are ahead of the current node. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this, this is what I was saying earlier also about the lattice structure of propositions and the lattice structure of open sets, that there's this uh, way to go between the two. Um, because if you think about it, what we talk about as an ultra filter, that's basically all, all nodes above a certain node, right? That forms mm -hmm. an ultra filter. So we can see that the ultra filter is... Uh, relevant for forcing yeah well that's a point ultra filter right mm -hmm. so we still have the generic ones which are the yeah. Kind of mysterious yeah yeah that one yeah that's we'll, we'll get to that but yeah for this one at least for for a simple idea like uh -huh. you have an ultra filter that starts at a point and then uh, kind of propagates to all future points Uh, yeah, so this is just basically to show, right, that this, this general notion of sheaves of structures um, includes uh, many of the other model theoretic things. And in fact, this is, this is kind of the, the use, a slightly more general version of a Kripke model, but it's essentially the Kripke model framework. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of what we can be thinking about as rather than just a Kripke model in some partial order, it's going to be on an arbitrary topological space. Um, but as we already know, right, a topological space is already kind of a partial order, right? Mm -hmm. It's just much larger because it's gonna, you can you can filter things like infinitely. Um, so this this is some some technical things. We don't have to go through all the specifics at the bottom. But I just wanted to add this um, because we talked about last week the uh, right Cohen's uh, uh, forcing with the whole schema of names, and everything, yeah. right? Um, and it's kind of, I think, confusing and a little bit unmotivated at some points. Um, but this is actually the construction of how you could think of this as a subcase of what we're talking about here, which is sheaves. That Cohen's names are uh, constructible as sheaves. In fact, sheaves kind of end up being one of like the core things in math. It's like, you can look at almost any object of importance and like maybe 70% of the time it's secretly some kind of sheath. Um, but basically, uh, if we can go through here, uh, the idea of this is when you pick a name, remember a name is composed of um, in another name and an ordinal, corresponding to that, right? So it's ordered and it has uh, 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 a condition on it as well, um, where you take the corresponding seat sheaf, it's gonna be what's called, this is the TLDR, we don't have to go into all the details. It's gonna be something called the, uni the universal sheaf with a generator at level P uh, for each P tau in sigma. So for each element of the name, um, with the relations of two things being related, uh, two points, two names, at level Q less than or equal to both of them, whenever they're forced at this level Q to be equivalent. Um, so this is uh, admittedly one of the things you have to, to, for it to start to click a little bit, you have to stare at it for a really long time. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the idea is we're taking for a name, we're taking this pre-sheaf, which is defined in this way, okay? Where this thing, P pre-sheaf, is just the pre-sheaf generated by a single element, okay? So all is, and this is on a post set, so think of some partially ordered set, mm -hmm. and then uh, it's gonna give a value to each thing in the post set. So if for some Q, it's gonna be the set, right, containing zero, which is just, the set containing the empty set. Um, if Q, right, if the thing you put into it is less than or equal to P, 
and it's going to be the empty set otherwise. So um, it's going to everything below it, it's going to map to this and everything above or not comparable to it, it's going to just map to the empty set. OK, so it's kind mm -hmm. of like the trivial thing. It's just keeping track. Is it less than or is it not? Um, then what you do is you glue. So this U thing here, this is the direct limit, which is essentially gluing them all together. So I'm going to say, I'm going to take the sigma pre-sheaf is going to take for each element P comma tau in sigma, uh, where P here is in this post set. It's going to basically union all of these like um, single element pre-sheaves together. Um, and then in order to sheafify it, to make this pre-sheaf thing, which is just taking all the things together um, by basically taking this relation um, that whenever that two things are going to be equivalent at a level Q if they're forced at that level to be the same. Um, so what that does is that ends up taking this thing, which is just a bunch of these um, pre-sheets taken together, and it's going to glue them uh, in such a way that you uh, get something that you can uh, uh, still, sorry, one second, I have to remind myself. Um, Oh yeah, so this is just trying to think of the names of the sheaf. So when we do this sheafification thing, we end up basically getting a uh, uh, belonging relation uh, that ends up uh, respecting the same thing. And then we can show that all of the properties match up, mm -hmm. um, which basically, right? And then once we have this, and then we uh, 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 take a section on it, a section on this sheaf, once we sheafify it, ends up being equivalent to actually choosing forced elements of sigma, which is what Cohen's doing when he's adding the, the forcing. So it's this is just to say that, um, yes, the names that we talked about before that's kind of unmotivated can be thought of in mm -hmm. this context. You know, it's complicated, but um, it is sort of the same thing. Um, maybe yeah, we won't go have to, super. Yeah, I have to look at that one again. Yeah, it's uh -huh. hard to follow. Uh, yeah, but yeah. I mean, the, 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 for the vague amateurish analogy is that uh, because but you moved from uh, the set, the, the subsets of this situation to the conditions, and then on the conditions, you get the names, right? Mm -hmm. so the conditions concern, let's say, the partially ordered set. On, let's say, uh, that's like the, the 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 sort of lattice-like organization of these parts, right? And the names are the thing where it's like the the fibers we're attaching with, with added structure, like the sections and stuff. Mm -hmm. Is that like? vaguely where the analogy goes through. But I mean analogy because it's not what yeah, you yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, right, I'm trying to go back to the to the more visual images you, you had of the sheaves before. Yeah, the I, in general, this is this is one thing I'll say about trying to maybe visualize them. Uh, the issue with sheaves, right, is of course there's many examples where you can visualize it very well, right? Like these Surfaces and things and covering spaces is a very easy way to visualize them. But mm -hmm. in general, um, sheaves, especially when you get things that glue in like non uh, non trivial ways, mm -hmm. uh, it ends up becoming very quickly almost impossible to really visualize them. Yeah. Um, often, and I don't know if there is really a, a visualization on this, but here the idea more is um, that these, right, these individual pre-sheaves on each individual thing 
and we're unioning them all together. Each one of them is just basically this like simple pre-sheaf that's indexing um, uh, one specific point in the post set. Mm -hmm. But then we do it over, we take all of, we take it over all of the um, P's, all of that uh, are in the name. So these would be the conditions, yeah? It'd be the condition and the mm -hmm. name. I yeah, the following frame two, there's like in your in that simple uh -huh. simple uh, drawing you made, uh, like we had the we had a post set here. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, why isn't this okay? Uh, and then you drew on top of it the the two sets like this, right? Mm -hmm. We had this. Uh, this the bottom is a is the post set. Yeah. So on the bottom is is P. Yeah. So P is the blue thing here. It's one of these, mm -hmm. like, right? And the names are actually the here. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, because yeah, the, so, the pre sheet yeah, comes fine. with the the sigma to the psh. So uh, the pre sheet is different from the name. Every name. Yields a pre sheaf. Mm -hmm. And the pre sheaf contains mm -hmm. basically one if you're smaller than the name, than the, the current point uh, in the post that mm -hmm. you're at, and empty otherwise. So it's like, um, seems like an ideal or where it's, um, I don't know if we can draw it here. Yeah, it's like everything. If 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 P is here, then my pre sheaf is this thing, P S H, which is equal to it's equal to one for everything that's less than P. Well, I'm off the page now, but everything less than P, and then um, zero if I'm well that's eight. yeah well that's right it's sort of it's it's um not exactly so that's what that's what p to the what this this p pre sheet thing is okay? exactly yeah yeah that's what this is right. the sigma okay. is going to be a direct product of a bunch of them which is basically just saying that it's basically a union you can think of it right mm -hmm. it's taking all of them as so it's just bundling them together and it's taking all of them as one set uh for all of the p tau and sigma for all of the p and p right? okay so there's many so of these the, per name is that right like is there many of these for yeah it's gonna be for each time each time you have in this in the name sigma mm -hmm. each time you have a p Come up so for each element of the name because the names are ordered right, such that one of the one of its elements is itself the name so it has this like mm -hmm. uh, inductive structure on it so the, i think the point of this is it takes this basic object which is just a map that's gonna it's like a um uh it's like what's it called in when you're using physics and things kind of like the uh I'm bringing it off the top of my head. Uh, or like an indicator function, right? That's just going to be something for one value and then zero otherwise. Mm -hmm. So here it's all, all this pre sheaf is doing, right? All of it's doing is it's saying um, either something is greater than or equal to, uh, oh, sorry, something is less than in this case, less than or equal to, oh, sorry. Yeah, you're plugging Q into it. So everything that is less than it will have zero. So it's, Defining basically the the downset 
yeah, um, downset. Yeah, so you're taking a union of the downsets for each one of the elements inside the name itself. So I think the idea of what this is doing is it's uh, at least once you take once you take this relation afterwards, what it's doing is it's uh, recreating the like inductive structure of the name, but constructively. I don't know if this makes sense because each one of these p to the pre sheaves is just like your basic canonical like indicator function. It's like the unique something like the whatever or unique up to one other function that whatever uniquely picks out this point P. Yeah. Um, and you glue a bunch of them together. Um, but then after the fact, you always have to, uh, uh, because you just take these together, you have to glue them back in order to actually get a, uh, a proper sheaf rather than the pre sheaf. To make sure that they glue together properly. Um, yeah, I don't know. If I can quite justify all the details and all of this stuff, but I think that's the idea. Uh, yeah, well, well, why is the different? What? What? Uh, again, T is. What is T again? So T here, right? There should be the name and the condition, right? Ah, okay. So, so the how, name, how the is name the is another name. Yeah, the name is another name, mm -hmm. and the condition is an ordinal. Yeah. So here tau is an ordinal, right? So this is saying, uh, right? So I'm gonna say P tau is equivalent to P prime tau prime at level Q. So noticing that like this forcing is always conditioned on some level of the post set, mm -hmm. meaning that it's contextual to that level. Mm -hmm. um, and you glue them together when at Q they're equal, but they might not always be equal these ordinals, right? Yeah. Yeah, John, did you have a question too? Yeah, you, um, just about the difference between the pre-sheaf and the sheaf, because you said that uh -huh, the sheaf uh -huh. requires like glue and back together. Does that mean that uh, pre-sheafs are often the double negative topology you brought up earlier? Are those kind of um, equivalent or is that a different kind of stage? Yeah, kind of. So the um, what the I have a little bit of thing on this later, but what the double negation topology does is it it takes you from a uh, classical world to an intuitionistic one, and this is um, the um, the situation in which most of like the constructive forcing happens. So usually you right you take some classical model, you do this double negation topology on it, which kind of changes the structure of the space. It makes it into an intuitionistic. It allows you to um, look at a much larger uh, set of models for the space, and then you can force something on that set of models such that when you glue everything back with a filter, it's going to preserve the force. Um, and that's like the sort of what is in common with all of the force or, or a lot of the forcing strategies, especially with like, like the co-enforcing and other uh, forcing of whatever infinite sizes and whatnot. Um, so it's almost, it's almost like the other side of the coin of the generic filters is the double negation. Um, but a one, I think really uh, good or uh, an interesting thing about the double negation topology specifically is I believe in, I think this only is true strictly in classical models. In classical models, at least it's equivalent to um, the dense topology, which basically is saying any set that's open is one that's going to be dense within it. So then uh, as long as um, something can be true, like almost everywhere, then you can force it to be true in the whole thing. So that's that's kind of a little bit of the relation between them. I think they're not strictly equivalent um, when you're in an intuitionistic world, but I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, 
double negation will come up again. And Levere has written a lot. Of, that's like a lot of what, I don't know if you know about his whole project to like, I think it was from a while ago. I don't think he's still working on it, but he like has this like formalization of Hegel's science of logic mm -hmm. with, with category theory. Um, and I know that double negation topology has a, has a very crucial role in that as well. Cool, yeah, that really helps, thanks. Yeah. Uh, let's see if that makes sense. Okay, we can go a little through a little more of this stuff, but we can always go back there. And I think we have more to cover from Reza's presentation later as well. Um, so I want to talk about a little bit about what's called the extensional property of truth in chief structures. So this is what I was talking about before, how we're going to say that something is true, not necessarily if it's just true at that point, but if it's true in a neighborhood containing that point. And basically, as long as we are precise with how we construct truth in neighborhoods in a consistent way, it ends up being okay. Um, like, it seems like this would be kind of a, a shady way to go about this, um, but it ends up working in a very natural way. So we think of sheaves of structures as being formed by variable objects, which vary or change over a structure of states of knowledge, right? So here, the states of knowledge would be um, uh, the uh, uh, the structure itself, right? So it's be the mathematical structure. So, like a sheaf of structures, for example, could literally be the structures can be groups, it can be rings, it can be whatever. Uh, it's a general enough language to include um, just about all of mathematics that can be modeled within it. Um, so we're going to say that a proposition is true about an object. An object here is going to be a section of the sheath. If it's true in an extension, aka a neighborhood in which the object lies. Um, so then formulated this way, it's not only uh, global properties you can learn about from the topological perspective, like the classic uh, example of like topological knowledge or something like the hole or like a hole in the space. Like when you look at a donut and you look at uh, it has the notion that it has one I guess, two dimensional hole that comes from the algebraic topology of the space and it's an invariant that you can actually uh, pick out and construct. Um, but it's not just global properties, but also local properties, right? Um, that um, we'll be able to get out. So I think this, this fuzzy way of conceiving of objects is more natural in the sense of um, uh, kind of aligning with our phenomenological intuitions and more general in the sense of um, describing more general structures because it's an, in an intuitionistic space rather than the classical one and includes all of classical set theory as a subcase. Um, uh, rather than, and I think it's slightly less essentialistic in the like, purely set theoretic perspective is very concerned always with what like absolute composition of something is, which I think, um, especially when we talk about things as not just like points, but as parts. So when we want to talk about the composition of something, what we're doing is not necessarily naming all the points of it, but mm -hmm. most of the time it's something like naming the parts of it in such a way that it covers the thing, right? In such a way that it can fully describe the thing. So this is a much more like fuzzy way. There's a lot more ways you can slice it up and talk about it in a coherent way um, than just these are the things that make it up or these are the points of the space. Um, so using this idea, um, we can think of a topological valuation, AKA um, like a measure on truth almost. Um, for a sheaf of structures that is directly gives intuitionistic truth values from propositions, right? Okay, so it's pretty simple. Basically we take uh, for any set of sections, these are the sections are the objects that we're gonna work on. Um, sections of some sheaf, um, actually I always thought this was A, I don't know if Dennis knows, or this was a U, but turns out this is an A. Oh wow! Really? Unrelated. Yeah, I was yeah. trying to figure out how to how to find the same uh, font, but this is an A in some weird 
LaTeX font. Um, but so we have sections, which we can think of as observers or objects um, on the sheet defined on an open subset U, okay? So then the truth proposition uh, of some proposition phi, the truth value of a proposition phi in the subset U, we're gonna define simply as the set of points in U such that um, on the node X, um, the proposition is forced. So it's gonna be the nodes X such that um, the sheaf forces this on it. So basically it's just taking all of the points in the base space that um, when we look above them, uh, our proposition will be uh, verified. So in this case, right, um, the bigger the set is, the sort of more true it is. And in fact, we're gonna end up saying that this proposition, right, is properly true or forced on the entire set, if and only if this set itself is the entire set. So it's kind of like a weird self-referential thing, um, but it does work. So um, we use this to define this topological evaluation, right? So we can get from formulas, right? So from the language of the space to actually on each set U get um, a set which maps its truth values in some way. And when we remember things about um, the subobject classifier, um, we'll see that this is literally mapping directly into the subobject classifier into the space. And all that stuff with fed you is compatible here. Yeah, I just wanna jump in and say that I think yeah, this slide, on. this slide and maybe like one other slide, I think are the most important slides in the whole mm -hmm. presentation um, because I think it well, for me, it clarified an idea about the degrees in Badu and in the transcendental, um, which is that degrees not only describe a, a magnitude of truth, which is how we int intuitively think of it, it's like how true is it, like not true at all to totally true. And there's some in between values that we don't, we don't really know how to understand um, or intuitively grasp. Um, but now I think the right way to think about degrees are as where something is true, mm -hmm. right? If a thing is maximally true, it's true everywhere. And if the thing is not true at all, obviously it's, it's true nowhere. But in between, there are as many possible ways you can slice up the space um, where the thing is true. So it actually has, it's, a, it's much more spatial. And it also, in my mind, connected the relation between points on the one hand and mm -hmm. truth on the other, right? So they're inherently uh, part of the same story. Mm -hmm. So I think that's going forward, just like keep that in mind that uh, a degree to say like the um, degree of existence or the degree of identity between two things is like P where P is something between maximal and minimal you're actually saying it's true in some places and not in other places. And then you have this order relation between degrees where, well, if it's true in this place, it must be true in this other larger space, right? Or yeah. sorry, smaller space all the way to, I guess the order really can be either way, but um, you can infer like, if something is true in this region, like if, if it's raining, in this city, then it must be raining in this neighborhood, this suburb or whatever, or this part of the city um, mm -hmm. is also raining. That's the power of, I think, all this stuff. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Cool. Uh, I think this next slide actually has the, some of the other good stuff. Yeah, okay. Um, so here, this is top, this is kind of divided into two sections. I should have put, I guess, a line underneath this, this bottom, uh, this uh, formula in the middle. But this, this first half is basically extending the idea of, of 
val the valuation of logical propositions. Uh, thank you. <laughs> the valuation of logical propositions, right? So we can define uh, the truth value of equality as uh, the sets where they're e where here, right? These are sections where their in their individual values on that section are equal. Um, so this could be um, maybe if we think about uh, uh, maybe our sheaf of structures is like the multiverse or whatever, right? We're we're in an ever in world, so uh, this this equality could be like between two different observers who at some point are in different worlds and at some point are in the same world. This is sort of like the place in which they they agreed something like that. And in the same way, you can do this for a lot of things. You can spatially uh, describe how logic, the logical uh, uh, relations work um, contextually, right? So all of this is always contextual in some set U. So it's not like this is giving like the, the whatever universal truth value for all sets or anything like that for any of these propositions. But it's saying how true these propositions are over this specific set. Um, and it follows here, right, that we say that, and this is the moving from the point perspective to the, to the more uh, like open set perspective, that the sheaf of structures U forces uh, a proposition on an entire open set or models a proposition on an entire open set, if and only if uh, the valuation of the uh, proposition on that open set is the entire thing itself. So this conforms right with this Bedouin idea of this is the top element. If we think of U itself as its own hating algebra, as having mm -hmm. its own transcendental, right? That's the topology essentially. Um, so it's always localized to something. Um, this is the, the maximal element it could possibly be within the subset. Um, and it's important that it's always, it's always relational to where it's coming from. Um, so- yeah. I just think that that is yeah. really mind blowing that I, mm -hmm. if I ask you in, in, in this frame of thinking, if I ask you a question like, is it raining? You don't tell me yes or no, you tell me, the places where it's raining mm -hmm. right so your, your answer is always a space that's the mm -hmm. i think it's very interesting yeah and the point is in order to get right this this yes or no from the space it ultimately ends up becoming some choice and this is what basically the filter of it a filter on the spaces it's going to end up being some choice of yes or no for each one of these things. So it's either, yes, this set on which it's true is big enough such that we can just sort of say that it's true, right? That it generalizes enough. Um, this is almost like something like, I guess, almost like what the process of science is, right? You can say that something, some scientific proposition in like the, whatever the, tr the tr traditional uh, perspective that, uh, uh, some scientific proposition is true once whatever certain amount of repeatable experiments can uh, uh, make the same prediction over and over. So it's it's always going to be some amount of truth, right? It's a truth in that case that is conditioned on all the experiments that have been done on that uh, on that specific proposition in that point of view. Um, so I think in this context, right, this. Uh, this is a really amazing, amazing point, uh, uh, I guess, theorem or corollary of this perspective is that the law of the excluded middle, right, which is what's going to force something to be classical here, um, is forced on a node X, right? So in a specific context, uh, in a sheaf of structures, if and only if there's a neighborhood U of X, so there's some uh, neighborhood around this point in the space space, Oops. such that the inverse of the sheaf, right? So this is taking the stock. So this is taking uh, uh, all, all of the structures on top of this open set that's containing this point 
is a Hausdorff topological space. So this is something I should probably define. Maybe, I, yeah, I meant to define it, I think. But the idea, uh, draw, yeah, and it's here. The idea of a Hausdorff topological space, if you guys have not seen it before, it's basically, it's gonna, we're gonna say a space is Hausdorff if and only if for any two points, okay? So for any uh, X and for any Y, uh, it's Hausdorff if and only if I can always draw some open set around each of them that don't intersect, right? Mm -hmm. So I can separate them by open set, yeah? Um, if on the other hand, um, I have something like, uh, there is this one construction, uh, I forget the name of it, but it's basically taking just the real line and it takes two copies of it uh, and it glues it everywhere, right? Except for zero, except for at zero. I'm gonna not glue it here, but glue it everywhere else. So this is actually a coherent thing you can do. Um, and it's, you can define the topology in a way that makes sense. Um, but it ends up being not a house door space because, right, you end up the resulting thing. So this is the covering of it. This is actually also, uh, actually, I don't think in this case it's a sheet, but um, you end up getting this second point here, which at the same time, right, is in these open sets. But mm -hmm. these two points are inseparable. Um, and there's a whole bunch of examples, but uh, a non house door space is like very, unintuitive it's hard to imagine what it is but you can pretty quickly um get some examples if you want yeah, to just to go back then yeah. to the statement the laws explain is parsing and no x in a structure you can only if there is a neighborhood u of x such yeah that... let's maybe draw a picture uh so let's say we'll have okay so we'll have some base space here okay mm -hmm. it can be a topological space so we're imagining it some kind of surface okay so we say that at some node X, right? So above X, uh, this is here, right? This is P inverse. So remember, this is the kind of topological way of I thinking of it. The inverse above, is, is, is sending us yeah. back to the- to It's the sending us back to the structure yeah. that's on top of it, I guess, yeah. So above P, whatever it is, some, some structure and above, this is the same above every single other point. Uh, and they, they all glue in some way. So it's saying that the law of the excluded middle holds if and only if, and remember when I have these structures, right? These don't have to be, look like fibers, right? They yeah, can yeah. be glued together here. Yeah, yeah. There can be weird stuff going on. There's probably in fact weird stuff going on, okay? So it's saying I can pick some set and the, it's always important that there's some set, right? It yeah. doesn't matter how small it is, as long as there's something that is reconsidered local around it, such that when I raise it and I go up, so that's going to be looking at these things, looking at this entire space. Mm -hmm. um, so it says that the law of the excluded middle is forced in X. So X is going to be classical if and only if the structures, there's some open set with structures around it, such that this is house door. Yeah, it being Hausdorff yeah. means that it kind of uh, it kind of mimics the property of being closed, right? Uh, no. Yeah, so Hausdorff means that you any... can you can distinguish oh. everything at some point, right? Like, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like, yeah. Pulled out. Yeah, it means that any. Some kind of yeah. Way. Yeah. yeah, any two points can be distinguished in some way. Yeah, it's yeah. it's counterintuitive because we think of distinguishing as as forming a border. Mm -hmm. So you but but if for some reason in topology you can distinguish two points with open sets. Yeah. Sets yeah, yeah, that yeah. don't have any yeah. any border. Yeah, I'm so, just trying so, to see yeah. because because there is a connection between this junction in the in the Hausdorff space and this junction mm -hmm. in the law of excluded middle, right? Yes. So it seems like the Hausdorff property there is doing something 
like some topological interpretation of something that is logically classical. Mm -hmm. I mean, it almost seems yeah. like it mimics the, the axiom of choice in a weird kind of way, right? Because it gives you the ability to reach in and pull out one thing where like what non-Hausdorff essentially means is like there's at well, least one yeah. pair in there that you can't separate out, right? Like you can't actually pull out just one. Not, yeah, not exactly because it doesn't, it doesn't uh, explicitly give you, right? So like the axiom of choice is basically saying for any uh, set, I can for, pick one thing, or sorry, for any set of non-empty sets, I can pick one thing from each one. That's the axiom of choice. This is saying for any two points, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter, it's an infinite set, I can pick open sets around each one of them. So that's conditioned on the topology, right? So uh, that there exists two open sets within the topology such that uh, their intersection is empty, right? And um, they uh, are, they surround each of the points individually. So yeah, it means, yeah. I like to think of the topology as, as I think I mentioned this before, is it's like the space, it's almost like a space of states of knowledge. It's like what is exactly, sayable yeah. within within the, the global space. But like normally, I mean, you can't always, especially when we think of propositions as subsets, right? Mm -hmm. We don't immediately have access to every single proposition that um, could, uh, uh, or, or we don't have access to propositions that can, uh, at least maybe not yet, that can, cut our space in any way we want. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Basically, because of Gerald, yeah, there's always gonna, gonna be more propositions from this perspective uh, that can be formed from the space um, that our language will not be sufficient to answer. Yeah, I was just gonna add in that the uh -huh. this picture, I mean, that's how I'm picturing it, that um, if you think about the lattice of propositions again, Mm -hmm. If you if you affirm one proposition, it it excludes a bunch of other propositions, and it makes other yeah. propositions possible. So law of excluded middle would look something like, if you had a node where both p and not p were possible, this is your current. Oh, sorry, this is like two different propositions, right? P and not p. Mm -hmm. They're in the same uh, state of knowledge in the sense of they're both still possible. You haven't proven one or the other. Now, the law of excluded middle, middle says if you were to prove one, you've excluded the other. So mm -hmm. um, taking one path means you can't take the other path. Mm -hmm. Right? So there's two, mm -hmm. there, there's two open sets that distinguish the two points. And you can only choose one. And if you choose one, it excludes the other. But if you don't have law, law of excluded middle, taking like proving p doesn't necessarily imply you've you've canceled out um sorry proving not p doesn't necessarily yeah. mean you've you've also forced p mm -hmm. right it may maybe down the road you, you may also uh find out you can't force p yeah so if you right, don't p, have okay yeah solution. that's a good way of thinking if you don't yeah, have and a, this looks very very like the, very much like the house door thing right i mean if i have if I have this, I think it is literally. I, I right, think that's I, I can actually yeah. make these two disjunct things. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, I, I can see now that that it does capture for it captures in a parts and holes kind of a mm -hmm. topological way. A, yeah. An aspect of what the excluded middle implies for propositions, right? That you mm -hmm. must be able to separate them in the P and not P in a disjunct way. Yeah. So this, I mean, yeah, the, the reason I include this specifically, this is, is like one of the most explicit connections between uh, the, the geometry and the logic. So we see that um, a, G, uh, a topological property, right, of being Hausdorff, of being able to separate uh, uh, points ends up conditioning the logic of the space. That's so crazy. Um, yeah. Yeah. Another crazy thing that we mentioned before, um, but that um, 
the a trivial case, right, is if the node x is either an isolate point or if the entire x is just one one point. Uh, so basically, what this is saying is that just okay, this is the entire category. Um, sheaves on top of this, sheaves on top of this, um, generalize any set we want. Um, so if we have this, so if we have a sheaf, which is you can take any any set, and this is gonna model any basically one set with any number of elements. Um, by by doing whatever a sheaf of structures over this, um, the idea is that the structure is the the generator basically. This is essentially right like the empty set that in set theory everything is built on around. Um, and in this case, right, if we're only doing it on one thing, we get exactly the classical case, which is that the sheaf of structures forces a proposition, uh, if and only if, uh, at the node X, it forces the proposition. So this mm -hmm. like uh, atomizes it and this is makes it into the classical case. So then now this doesn't depend at all on uh, how you move within the space is not conditioned on that, it's just whether it applies at the point or not. Mm -hmm. And this, right, these structures on top of this space, this is all of set three. <laughs> this is all of set three done here. Very, there you go, done. Set, set theory, done. <laughs> so that set theory is like so you, basic. If yeah. you like, can somehow detect that a space is housed or if you know that no matter where you're gonna go in it, it's gonna, these statements are gonna be true. Is that the uh if you can detect like yeah but here this yeah yeah but here, it's like so homogeneous not, somehow once you yeah. detect hausdorff right yes yeah it's homo yeah it's if, if it's hausdorff it's classical yeah and this is the whatever the space of sheaves of structures over a point so this is for the the global section Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. This is this the, the the fiber over the over the um, over the open set. Okay, let me clear these. Uh, any questions? I guess it's already getting kind of. I don't know if we want to continue or if we want to uh, wrap up because I think this is a round where it starts to get really crazy. Um, so if we really wanted to. Yeah, we can continue Go. next week if you guys. I mean, I think, I think I think might wanna see. What yeah. what do you guys have still for this? Just so we can. Uh... This this is where the generic model stuff, and I also I had to kind of gloss over a lot of the details. Uh, this is there you go. Yeah, I think we can. We can oh, use. I mean, yeah. I think we can. We could try to combine. For next week, like what's left in yeah. this presentation, what Reza wanted to talk about, which I think probably mm -hmm. fits very well, and then just have a we debate. We can do that and on... start at gen. Actually, we can start in generic models. Yeah. There's a couple of things here I wanna I wanna tweak a little bit, anyways. So yeah, I know that man. That, but that this was so clarifying. So many. So hopefully, this was a little good. Yeah, this was great. Gosh, it made sense of um, so many different things. Yeah, hopefully, sheaves make a little bit of sense. They no, do not. They're... Even before now, they, I was like, what are these? And now I kind of understand it a little <laughs> bit. So. Um, no, this was really helpful. And, and, continuous and might I say, really, really pretty presentation. Yeah, um, <laughs> found some good pictures for it. Uh, cool, okay. You can yeah, great, no, no, okay. So, so I think there's a lot to work with. I'm gonna, uh, listen to it again uh, for next week, sure. just so we can kind of also force as much as we can kind of all this material into the kind of unsaid stuff in logics of world. I saw that you guys mm -hmm. are already going to go into this anyway, but yeah, I think it's a good idea to, to, to have this in mind for next week. So we get to cover that as well. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, but also, guys, um, you see, I've had cats climbing me this whole time at the end. <laughs>
that yeah. wants to learn wants to learn what a generic model is as well. Um, yeah, true. I was gonna say, uh, yeah. So I also can talk about the exchange fee for next time. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's some slides on that, and I, yeah. I mean, the the crazy thing is this. I'm still my mind is still blown by this, like the the spatial interpretation of mm -hmm. of things. Um, but I, I think that actually clarifies like what we were trying to do in the primer with this exchange sheaf uh, a bit mm -hmm. further. So hopefully we can tie it back to that and make the primer a little bit clearer. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully I can go through, I wanna maybe try to see if I can clarify a little bit some of the stuff on the, specifically on the forcing stuff. It's very, cause it's very hard to, I guess, conceptualize because it feels very recursive and mm -hmm. it kind of is by, by how it's constructed. Um, but it's constructed in a very similar way that the uh, the cumulative hierarchy of sets is constructed. Yeah. In fact, there ends up being the a cumulative hierarchy here, which is like a more complicated hierarchy, basically. Um, yeah, this is what something we were talking to Reza last time, like right at the uh -huh. ending of it. That it's interesting that Cohen doesn't. It's not like you cannot make a. Uh, and, and actually, this goes back to something that I'm more and more convinced, you know, like in uh, post-war philosophy, usually you have two fields, the poor taste philosophers who are all for the correspondence theory of truth, and the good taste mm -hmm. revolutionary philosophers who say that truth has nothing to do with that. And like Lacan and Derrida and these guys say like, well, the idea of corresponding the you know, truth being like the correspondence of some proposition and a, st and a state of affairs, that's like so outdated. And mm -hmm. uh, what are your criteria for that correspondence? And they criticize this and they propose something else, right? And more and more I'm realizing that Badiou is actually absolutely classical. I mean, he's all for this correspondence theory. It's just that the reference of these propositions, mm -hmm. they it, he's a materialist. You can actually construct the reference. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is, you can get a feel for this, this specific strategy, which is not yeah. uh, with a move from Godel to Cohen, because it's not like he abandons the idea of benefiting from a cumulative hierarchy and, mm -hmm. and the way that this guarantees some sort of coherent structure on your propositions. He just doesn't construct it on these, let's say, simple statements from this definable uh propositions from the get-go so it's not like you abandon the idea of correspondence you just show that you don't need to kind of apply it in you know in the let's see very very uh simplifying saying like kind of this more intuitive way right that well i can i can make simple statements about what's in, up in front of me all complicated statements are somehow derived from this simple statement Mm -hmm. uh, you can still have a, a theory of truth that does keep this idea of correspondence to some level. You just can be yeah. very, very clever on what, you're, what it's referring to and how you construct this sort of recursive building blocks, right? Yeah. I think the point of, yes, you're right about the correspondence, but it's always, what it's referring to, right, is always some substructure topology, which is like the main point here yeah that that choice is always like a constructive choice mm -hmm. like it, you have to sort of build it with the language or whatever yeah yeah um it's never like you never have access to everything all at once yeah and in order to actually name things it takes work to build it out and then after the fact you can see oh yeah it was just a correspondence i think that's kind of the yeah yeah no i, I agree with you yeah. and, and i don't yeah. even think about you would like to, to to put him in this field because in so yeah. many ways he's he's saying he's doing something else, and I think uh -huh. that it is a fundamentally different approach. But it's not this romantic other thing. Yeah, so it's much more playing the same field and then showing that there's more to it than it seems. Then, mm -hmm. right? For example, rather than defining, rather than than names being useful because you know they they're naming previous names and the previous names are naming previous names that are actually naming 
the empty set, therefore you get this mm -hmm. perfect kind of cumulative hierarchy. You can name something at a rank so that it's actually capturing information about the ordering, not so much about what the fuck here is there, right? Mm -hmm. That's still uh, in the same ballpark of the strategies. It's much closer to this classical approach. It just takes you some, somewhere else, but it's, uh, I don't know, it's just something that by studying this a bit more now, I, I see a bit more clearly, like, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, and I feel like this is actually a big kind of, uh, a big part of how counter, counterintuitive his approach is because he wants to arrive at something that very radical continental philosophers want to say, something like mm -hmm. truth is not the same as knowledge or it's not the same as something just being veridical. And he says, okay, you're right. That's a property of truth I want to preserve. But you guys want to let go of a lot of more classical tools of, you know, semantics and, uh, and understanding of truth. You don't need to let those things go to keep that property mm -hmm. as a verifiable thing at the end, right? It's really weird. <laughs> yeah. But it also, I think the important thing is it always requires, I think, the faith that the world is infinite yeah. in and of itself, right? Um, which I don't think very many people say, but I think when you really work through it, it becomes pretty natural. Yeah, I mean, this is something that also changed my mind a bit. Like in the beginning, mm -hmm. I used to think that it meant that Badiou is, in, is claiming that there are, I mean, that his strong statement is there are infinitely many things in the world. Mm -hmm. But I think that his strong statement is properties of the world that you see if you're engaged in struggles, if you're interested in science and so on, they are better, they're more natural if you assume the world to be like, mm -hmm. they become tractable. So you can, you, can, uh, you can take this as a sort of abductive, pragmatic reasoning. You don't mm -hmm. need to take it as a kind of metaphysical plane. You can simply say like, it's weird how some stuff that you know and see empirically if you're engaged in certain things they look like impossible enigmas if you assume mm -hmm. the world to be finite and they look very natural and and thinkable if you assume the world to be infinite like yeah. so the strong claim is about the existence of these procedures and the infinity of the world is well something that looks quite true if those things exist mm -hmm. rather than yeah. the inverse right I need to convince you that the world is infinite and therefore you will ex accept that those procedures exist. That's not really how I think he operates. Yeah. I think you also see, you also see where the infinite in the world and one possibility, right? When we can talk about like possible worlds as mm -hmm. being, or at least they're like close enough as being part close enough to the world. So uh, in the sense that we can say those exist, right? Then there's already infinitely many things that could be different, but also, when we think of objects as parts in and of themselves uh, within an open set and like uh, explicit instantiations of them as like a point in that set, then you can like continuously vary yeah. um, like the properties of the objects in infinite ways and still stay within the boundaries. Um, I, I have the impression those. that this discussion on infinity, infinity of the world, uh, it's probably where why Kripke is not Badiou? Like being an mm. analytic philosopher, more much more classic in a way, surely not interested in like making bold statements about the actual world. I mean, he prefers to associate infinity to counterfactual space, right? Mm -hmm. And Badiou mm. associates infinity to actual space. To actual space, yeah. And I think that that might be the case why for him, like possible worlds are just okay. It's this other thing. Right, mm -hmm. and for Badiou, in assuming that the world is infinite actually makes this possible option. Like the interesting part of it is that it is actual, it's, or possibly actual, mm -hmm. not that it's actually possible. Right? It's <laughs> but it's an interesting comparison. I haven't I haven't seen anything yeah, yeah, written yeah. on this. It'd be interesting. Okay, guys, cool. thank you so much, man. Let's spend another week thinking about this stuff. Yeah.
Thanks, Hopefully guys. Hopefully, have you better thoughts about it. Yeah. See you guys next week. All right. All right. See y'all. See y'all. Bye-bye.